Welcome to Live Doff, your online Doff Yomi Shear. Shalom Aleichem and welcome back to today's Daf Hayemi, Baba Metzia Kuf. We are right on top of the Mishnah Hamachlif Parabachamar. So a fellow uh, exchanged. He gave him a cow and he took a donkey. Rashi stresses that the Mishnah is using the word Machlif instead of Meicher. Because when a person actually you know, buys, Meicher typically refers to purchase through money. He's not really going to acquire the item until he does Mashiach, he takes physical possession. And once he does that, he knows what's going on. He's, he knows exactly what happened when, because he has it in his hands, in which case we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have this whole situation of uncertainty in the Mishnah. Rather, he was Machlev. He made a switch. He employed Kinyan Chalipin. So he offered him a cow in exchange for a donkey. And as soon as Shimon took Ruben's cow, automatically the um, donkey belonging to Shimon now reverts to Ruben's ownership. Belongs to Ruben automatically, even without Ruben physically taking possession of the item. Or vice versa. Right? He takes the, uh, takes the donkey. Right? Ruben takes Shimon's donkey. Automatically, Ruben's cow, which was presented as the exchange item, automatically belongs to Shimon. Hamachlev parabachamar v'yalda. The thing is that, let's say, you know, the cow gave birth. We're not sure when it happened because it was sitting in the farm. Ruben picked up the, uh, did Mashiach on the donkey. But the cow wasn't here. The cow was elsewhere. By Ruben's doing Mashiach on the donkey, the cow, wherever it is, belongs to Shimon. But the thing is, we don't know when it gave birth. Before the Kenyan was made, in which case it belongs to Ruben, the offspring belongs to Ruben, or the uh, animal gave birth after the Kenyan was made, in which case the animal and its offspring belong to Shimon. Now the Mishnah uses the word Meicha, says Rashi, because he's selling his Shifcha. This fellow is buying his uh, maidservant with money. You can be kind and Eved, Knani with Kesef. So once again, he does the Kinyan Kesef, but the actual object, in this case the Shifcha, is elsewhere. He doesn't have to actually do a Kinyan with the Shifcha directly. Kinyan Kesef works even, you know, remote control, right? Even from a distance. So now he, he sold the, the shifcha, v'chein ha'mecha shifcha, so he yelled and he gave birth. I'm not sure when it happened, before the fellow purchased or afterwards. So we have a disagreement. Ruben says, look, uh, this happened before. I sold the, the, uh, the animal or the uh, shifcha, in which case the offspring is mine. And Shimon says, no, no, no. The customer claims that it happened after the purchase. They split it. Next case. Ruben had two slaves for sale. One big, one small. Likewise, if he's selling two properties, one large and one small. And there's a question as to which one he sold to Shimon. Shimon claims, I bought the bigger one. And Ruben says, I'm not sure. So Shimon now takes the larger one because Ruben doesn't know. And Shimon's claim is stronger. But let's say the Meicher's claim is stronger. The seller says, look, I know, I sold you the smaller one, less expensive one. And Shimon says, I'm not sure, you're right, I don't know. He only has a right to the smaller one. And in the final case, let's say, Ruben claims, it was a smaller one that I sold you. Shimon says, I bought the bigger one. So in this case, the seller has to swear to support his claim that he sold the less expensive item. And then we have a case of let's say they're both not sure. Yachlaika, they split it. Asks the Gemara, I don't understand, what's the point of splitting things? 
So we go back to the first case, right? He sold him a, he switched to a cow for a donkey. He gave birth, not sure when. Mission says they split it down the middle. Why? Amai yachlaiku. Let's take a look at where the item is sitting. And he becomes a muhsuk, he's in possession. In which case, he's the, you know, the presumed owner, unless proven otherwise. Let's take a look. Where's the item situated? And the other one, the opponent, will not have to prove his case to get it out of him. If you want to take something away, you have to prove your case. So why does he have to split it? Just hold on to it until further notice. So the Gemara was assuming that it was situated in somebody's property. No! The animal, the offspring, was sitting, you know, out in the wilderness, right? So we don't have the the concept of, of Rishos and Chazaka here because it's sitting in a no man's land. So now it's a question of who owns it. We don't know. We split it. Shivcha Nabi, the same story with the Shivcha, the kind of a Simta. She was situated in some sort of um, alleyway near the street. So basically nobody was in possession. Asks the Gemara, okay. So you don't have uh, current physical possession, but you have the former owner, who again is presumed to be the current owner. That's the Allah, Cheskas Marokama. He was the known owner until now. Venukma Acheskas the Marokama. Let's attribute it to the former owner. And we'll assume that he is the owner until proven otherwise. Will he have Idach? And the other fellow will have to prove his case to get it away. Hamaiti Mechaver Adorai. Answers the Gemara. Ha'mani sumchasi. The Mishnah reflects Shitas sumchas, who holds that when we have this type of case, we don't say ha'moitzi mechaveru elav araya. The Amari says mamen hamutal b'safik cholkin. When there's uncertainty as to ownership, we split it. Bleishvo without any need to swear or to make any. Asks the Gemara. Eimor the Amar sumchas b'shema b'shema. You know sumchas's case over there in Baba Kama Daf Memvav is regarding. Shema against a Shema. He doesn't know. He doesn't know. Okay, so we split it down the middle. But in our Mishnah, Bebari Ubari Mi Omar, in our Mishnah where uh, each uh, side is claiming with certainty that he's right, Bari against the Bari, who's to say that we apply Yachlaiku, even according to Sumchas? Omar Rabba, Baraf Huna, yeah, in, yeah. Omar, Sumchas, Havilu, Bari, Bari. Here's the news. Sumchas holds that even by Bari against a Bari, you say Yachlaiku. Rabba Omar, no, he disagrees. Lo Elam Ki Omar, Sumchas. Shema v'shema. Shemchas only uh, applies yachleiku when there's uncertainty on both sides. I will bury you, bury you, Omar, but not when both sides are positive. So back to the question, why do we say yachleiku in our Mishnah? But to me, let's revise the actual wording or the meaning of the Mishnah. Za'imar shema. Instead of both sides being confident in their claims, they're both not sure. Maybe maybe it happened before I sold it and it belongs to me. The customer says, Maybe it happened after I purchased it. That explains why it's like. But if it would be bury against the bury, you wouldn't say that. Tanan. Let's fast forward to the last case of the mission, where it's a Shema against a Shema. Nobody knows what happened. Ruben and Shimon both are not sure what happened. Yachlaiku, we split it. Now, let's go back to Rava. And Rabba Barafuna. Bishlema the Rabba. So according to Rabba, this works. With the Seif Hashem of Hashem. Just as the last case in the Mishnah speaking, where they both don't know, we'll assume that Reish Nami, the first case in the Mishnah, is likewise speaking about a similar case, Shem of Hashem, and that works. Because according to Rabba, because it's Shem of Hashem, you say, Achlek, El of the Rabba Barafuna. But according to the other opinion, the Amar who says, In Amar Sumchas Afilu Bori Bori, that Sumchas applies Yachlek, even when there is there are confident opponents here, right? They're both claiming with certainty. Still we say, Ach So why? It would seem redundant that the Mishnah would have to go and proceed and describe a case where it's Shema V'Shema. Well, Hashta Bari, Bari, Ami Ach Once we've learned in the first case of the Mishnah where it's a Bari against a Bari, still we say, Ach it's a huge Chiddush. Why even need... Why even... Come to discuss why we have to even go into the last case of the Mishnah, Shema Vashema, and Boy. It goes without saying that when they're both not sure, of course you split it. So why does the Mishnah have to trouble itself to go into that case? Well, this wouldn't prove anything, says the Gemara, regarding our discussion. 
You know why the Mishnah? Don't know safe for the Gliya Rish. The reason why the Mishnah concluded with Hashemah Vashemah is to reveal to us, to indicate to us how to truly understand the first part of the Mishnah. Meaning, to remove any misunderstanding where one may think that the first part of the Mishnah is speaking about Hashemah Vashemah. But if it would be a bari, yes, the bari, he wouldn't say achlok. No, remove that misconception. That's why the Mishnah concludes with a case of Hashem of Hashem. Tano seif of Hashem of Hashem. We conclude with Hashem of Hashem, which tells you, look, this is Hashem of Hashem. But up until now, meaning the case in the beginning of the Mishnah was speaking where it's bari be bari, and still we say achlok. We're going to Rabbi Barafuna based on some chesed halach. Mechlal the reisha bari bari, which indicates to us that the first opening case of the Mishnah is actually. A bari against the bari, and still, if you look, still you say achleiku, you split it down the middle. Tanan. Let's proceed to the next case of the Mishnah. Now he sold him an item. Not sure. He claims he sold him the less expensive item. The buyer says, "What do you mean the big field?" Yishava hamecher shekaten macher. Mishnah says the seller has to swear to support his claim that it was a smaller one. Bish now bish lemelu rava da amar ki amar sumchus. Shema v'shema. Now, this works well according to Rabbah who says, well, Sumchus' concept of Yachleiku is only what's a Shema v'shema. Nobody knows, so we split it. Avul bari, bari loyomar. But if it's a bari against a bari, we don't say Yachleiku. So that explains the Allah of the Mishnah. That's why he has to swim. Shema v'shema, you shava, you can't just split it. Ela the Rabbah barav hunu da omar in, but according to the other opinion, omar Sumchus afilu bari, bari, even when both sides are confident, we still split it. Amar yishava, maichar. So why does... The Meichar says, I have to swear, just split it down the middle of the Yach Me by the should have said, Yach Leiku. Answers the Gemara, here it's different. Mother Sumchas, even Sumchas, who typically says Yach Leiku, would agree in this case. Heicha de Ika Shvodai Raisa. Where the, the situation triggers a Shvua obligation, Menat Torah. As we're going to see in a minute, because the Be'inon will remember the Gemara, as we're about to get into that discussion. So basically, if the situation mandates a shvodai raisa, then that explains why the meicher has to swear. It's a totally different situation. I'm going to say in a minute how, how we even have a shvodai raisa. We have many kashas, many reasons why we don't. We shouldn't have a shvodai raisa. Okay, let's see. So we proceed to the next case. He sold him a slave. Doesn't know which one. Seller says it was a small one. The buyer says the big one. So the Mishnah says, The seller has to swear that in fact it was a small one. First of all, why, what's the basis of a shvua here? I mean, he's totally denying. You know, he's claiming A, he's responding with B. That's not something which typically triggers a shvua. It's not like a moid of a miktas. It's not like he's partially admitting. He didn't respond to his claim. Whatever he responded wasn't really part of the claim. Right? Two different, um, two different entities. You know, a big slave and a small slave. It's not, like, it's not like I admit to 50 of your 100. Where it's all about money, it's just about numbers. So it's considered a partial admission. But here, you're asking for slave A, I'm responding with slave B. It's a totally different entity. Avoid another question. Even if it would be considered a partial admission, it might be mixed as the halacha is. If I admit to 50 out of your $100 claim, and I say, look, here, take your 50. There is an opinion back in Baba Metziah, Dav Dalad, that you put, it's not considered might be mixed as, because I'm actually paying it right now. So here as well, he's offering a small evidence, here, take it. That doesn't qualify for a shvua of might be mixed as, at least according to some opinions. Next question. Right, so the second question was, hey, look, v'oid, another question, ain't is b'oid ala v'adim. We never apply shvua when it comes to a, a claim relating to slaves or real estate, as we discussed back in Baba Kham. So what's going on? Why shvua in the picture at all? Amar rab betoyned me evit. You're right. Uh, it was never a question of a slave. It was a question of getting refunded for the money that he offered him for a slave. And that's where the disagreement began. Well, I offered you a million dollars for a large slave. Hey, give me back the million. Well, you only offered me a half a million for a small slave. So it's a question of dollars and cents. So it's back to numbers. Right? To me, I've had Godel. To me, I've had Cotton. Same thing with, this, with the real estate, with the fields discussed in the mission. It wasn't an actual large or small field that he's demanding right now. He's asking his money back. 
the 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 transaction failed. Fine, refund me the money. He says, "Well, I got a million for the big." He said, "No, you are, you you only offering for the small field. Here, take your half a million back." So it's all about thousand cents in numbers. So that pretty much answers right. It's not talking about karka. And this is your classic way to make sense, right? Ushmol Ushmol says, no, no, no. Betoyin exus evet gadol, exus evet katan. Let's uh, stick to the um, actual, you know, the, the wording of the Mishnah, which speaks about a disagreement regarding a slave or a field. Yeah, it was, but instead of the actual slave up for disagreement, it was the garments. Exus evet gadol. Look, I purchased large, super-sized uh, begotten of a large slave. So severed cotton. No, he says, uh, I only uh, sold you this, you know, many, many small clothes for small evet. Same thing with the, the sada. He's not actually, actually demanding now the, the sada. He's saying, Oymri sadek doilo. Oymri sadek tano. Rashi says, on the bottom uh, three lines here, Minyan Oimrim Shasadak Dola, Vizar Oimrim Minyan Oimrim Shasadak Tana Machatilah, but speaking about bundles, bundles of grain. I bought, you know, your whole field of bundles, not the field itself, the bundles of your large field. And he says, no, I only sold you the small number of bundles, the ones from the smaller field. <coughs> so again, we're not speaking about uh, an Evid or Karka per se, and therefore there's no issue here of um, Shavu on the Evid, and that explains why. It's your classic moedah b'miktas. He's partially admitting to the claim. Well, says the Gemara. I understand by the, you know by the bundles it makes sense. Uh, he's uh, asking for a hundred bundles. He's responding with fifty. So moedah b'miktas qualifies for ishvor. But when it comes to the garments, I mean, ksus right? Mashatana loy We're running into that same question again. The two separate entities. It's not like a smaller garment is a part of a bigger garment, right? You can't take a you know a extra large shirt and cut it in half and have two small shirts, right? <laughs> so when it comes to this uh, claim regarding the ksus, mashatanoi, right? His claim was extra large uh, shirt. he didn't uh, concede to that. and the item that he conceded about the small, the uh, you know size small shirt, the one that belongs on the small heaven, it was not really in response to his claim. He didn't ask for a small shirt. So basically, back to the question, it's not called Moedu Vimixas. Kadam Rapapa, the Yalfi, the answer is, just as Rapapa tells us later on, that we're speaking about a certain type of garment which has sort of sections. Right? So you can sort of, you know, take apart the, the, the material. The Yalfi here as well, we're speaking about this type of case. So basically, he's asking for three yards of material, for instance, and uh, he's responding with two yards. So, although we're speaking about a garment, but if it's like sort of a uh, detachable garment, then in fact, it qualifies for moidu miktas. I'm offering you part of your, uh, uh, part of your taina, part of your uh, claim. Asks the Gemara, Kashi Leila Rabbi Yeshi, had a kash on this. Where, where do you find any indication in the Mishnah that they're discussing uh, clothing and garments? They're discussing slaves. Midik susk tani. Where does the Mishnah mention anything about garments? Evet tani. It speaks about slaves. Elon Rabbi Yisha. See, tweaks the terrors a little bit. Shmuel's terrors. It's got to be modified a little bit. Kigon shatana yevet b'ksusay v'sada b'imriya. The claim will pertain to both. He had a double claim. I bought the very tall evet with his garments. The fellow responds, No, it was the uh, midget evet with the small garments. Same thing with the, uh, the Sada. I bought this large field full of uh, bundles, 100 and count. The fellow responded, no, I sold you the small field. There's only 50 bundles on. So basically, he's asking for both the Evan with the Xus, and in the case of the Sada, the Sada with the Aymer. And Rashi explains that the Mishnah will now require a Shvua. He'll have to swear to substantiate both claims, the, the seller will, because... In effect, he did moidu b'miktas. He did concede partially, at least pertaining to the um, to the ksus and to the oimrim, and that's just a regular item. That's not karka. That's not avodim, and that qualifies for shua. 
And Rashi says, based on the concept of Gilgul Shavu, which we had the other day, you sort of roll it over, you include other items. Once you're on the Shavu stand, we sort of throw it all in there. And once he has to swear to substantiate his claim regarding the the garment or the uh, or the bundles which qualify for a Shavu, he also has to include and substantiate his claim regarding the Eved as well and the you know on the field as well. Asks the Gemara, hold it one second. He asked for the large garment, and I'm responding with a small garment. But it's apples and oranges, right? Same question as before. Vakati Ksus, regarding the garment element of this discussion, right? What he asked for, I didn't respond with. What he responded with wasn't part of the claim. Two different types of garments. Omra Papa, that was the terrace we had before, but the Alfi, it's a you know a garment with sections that can be taken apart. So in effect, when I concede to a smaller amount, it's really part of the bigger item. It's called Moedim Mixes. Kash leader of Sheshus. So Sheshus has a kash on this whole discussion. So what's the point of the Mishnah? That the Chiyuf, to make a Shvu on the metatalan aspect of this discussion, on the items, right? The item portion of the discussion. Triggers a shvur, allows it to expand into the sort of forbidden territory, onto the evidence as well, which typically does not justify for a shvur, onto the field as well, right? So is the mission trying to, uh, coming to inform us about the Allah of Zaykikin, that you can expand the shvur. Once you get it going, you can include other things as well. Tanina, we already have this mission back in, uh, in Kedusha and elsewhere. Nechasim she'en lanachrais. refers to items which you know, are not secure, basically mobile items. So if there's a shvu triggered by way of a disagreement on those items, you can now include other items as well, things which wouldn't typically justify a shvu. As a nechasim she'esh lanachrais, it includes, it can now include even property, real estate, which are typically secured items, yesh lanachrais, the shavalein to impose a shvu on them as well. So what's the Chiddush of the Mishnah? I mean, it's a pretty straightforward, fundamental Allah, which we've, we're, we have already learned elsewhere. Elam of Sheshis. Okay, so Sheshis has a, yet a third Pshat to explain the Mishnah. How do we get a Shvua here? So we have Rav's Pshat, that they're just discussing, uh, you know, value, money. Shmuel's Pshat, that we include the garment or the bundles as well, that sort of triggers the, facilitates the Shvua. Rav Sheshis is Pshat like this. First of all, we had a kasha. How can you make a shvu on an evet? Right? And the evet does not justify a shvu. We don't make shvu on real estate, on avodim. Amar of Sheshus, Allah of Sheshus, Amari Rab Meir, going like Rab Meir Shita, the Amar Avdok and Metal from Dummy, he treats an evet like any other mobile item, and it's not exempt from a, a shvu. So that explains why he has to swear uh, in response to a claim regarding an evet. But still, we haven't really addressed the other issues. Where's the Moedah of Miktas? If it's squarely a claim regarding the size of an Evid. He asked for this Evid, he's offering this Evid. Again, the same expression, right? You're asking apples, I'm responding with oranges. So why am I making a Shvua? You're asking for a big Evid, I'm offering you a small Evid. So we're going like Ramam Lil Shito, who says you make a Shvua, even in that case. So it's another Chiddush on top of a Chiddush. So firstly, it's based on Ramir, that you make a shvur regarding a claim on Avadim, and Sabal Karam Amalil, we're going to Karam Amalil as well, the Tznan who says like this. Submission begins, Ta'anai Chitim, Vahidli B'Sayrim Potter. Reuben asks for Chitim, look, you owe me Chitim, and Shem says, no, no Chitim, I owe you barley. He's Potter. Rabbi Shit, Rabbi Amalil, Machayev, he says you have to make a shvur even in this case, and that's discussed uh, you know, over there in Gemara and Shvurs. So basically, our case justifies uh, a shvu as well because that's what happened. He asked for a large evet and he's responding with a small evet. Well, okay, we've addressed two out of, th- two out of three concerns. Remember, we had three kashas. I'm not really admitting to what you're asking for. Number two, heiloch, I'm offering to you right now. Third, it's an evet. There's no shvu in evet. So that we answered. Evet, there is a shvu. Um, even if you ask for A and I responded with B, there is a shvu as well. It's considered like a moed of a because um, I'm offering you something of lesser value, even though it's not the same exact you know material or item. And regarding the other question, halach, right? The fact is, offering it to him outright. It's not like he's just 
agreeing that he owes them. He's giving to him right now. Akati Hilachu. So it's not like a partial admission. I'm just paying it off right now. It's out of the equation. Well, answers the Gemara. Amarav Abda the Katali Yadi. You have to add another twist to the story. Sure, here's a small ever that I believe I owe you, but he removed his hand. So basically, he's not even giving him. Even the small Ebed, he's not giving him a full Ebed. It's missing a part of the Ebed. Or in the case of the field, with Sada, he damaged it. Shechafar, the seller, is not giving him a full field. Shechafar, Rabbeiris, Shechanam Aris, he dug all kinds of ditches and things, right? So it's not Halach, doesn't qualify for Halach. He's admitting that he owes him the small field, but he's not even giving him the full field. He's giving him a broken, a damaged field. So it qualifies for Yishvua of a Maidu Mikzas. Asks the Gemara, so we're saying that according to Rabbi Meir, you make a shvua for avodim, but Rabbi Meir ifcha shaminele. We seem to find that Rabbi Meir holds just the opposite. That an evid has a din of real estate to a certain extent. This not we have a mission. Gosel beima beiskina. Shimon steals Ruben's animal and he holds on to it for fifty years. It's now an old cow. Avodim beiskina. He steals a slave, and it's fifty years later. Mishalom kishas akzela koin to tanakama. He has to pay based on the item's value at the time of the uh, theft, right? It was worth more then than it is now. Rabbi Omer, yeah, you're right, when it comes to a behemoth, former value. But when it comes to a slave, a slave is like real estate. It's not technically considered stolen. Halachically, it's considered as though it never left its owner's possession. In which case, I can just give it back to you now. Rabbi Omer, when it comes to a stolen slave, even if it's 50 years later, Omer, you can just tell him, Take your uh, dear slave back. So bottom line, Ramir seems told that an Evid is like Karka. In which case, it wouldn't trigger a Shvua, just like Karka doesn't. How could we say otherwise? Holy Kasha, this wouldn't be a Kasha. Could the Machlev Rav Baravu of Etanya? Rav had a different Gersa in that Mishnah. He switches the names. Vitani, he learned like this. Ramir, Ramir, Mishalom Kishas Akzila. According to Ramir, when the slave... Um, was stolen and it's 50 years later he grew old you have to pay based on the value at the time of the robbery because the evidence like metatalin and that corresponds with our sugya that according to Ramir you make a shvona a claim pertaining to an evid that's Ramir Shida Chamaim Ramir Chamaim Ramir the ones who say that an evidence like Karka and you just give him back as it is so I was thinking okay Fine, so we've established that according to the mayor, evidence is like metatalin. You can make a shoe on it. But what about the other case of our Mishnah, which pertains to Karka, right? The large and small field that was, right? Purportedly sold. Elamimai, the Sovereign Mayor, Makshin and Karka Le'evit. Who says according to the mayor? We equate Karka, real estate, to an Evid. And we say, my Evid is just like you can make a shoe on an Evid, as we've just established. Av Karka and Shboyan, likewise, you can make a on Karka, which would fit the bill regarding our Mishnah. Dilma, maybe, no. There is a difference between Evid and Karka. Dilma, Evid, Udun, Yishboin. You can only make an, a Shwan and Evid, the country of Meir. Evid is like Karka, uh, like Metatlan. But Karka is Karka. Abla, Karka, loy. But on Karka, you don't make a Shwan, which is a universal halacha, right? It's a universally accepted halacha, based on Psukim, right? So who says Rameir disagrees with that? And if that's the case, how are we going to substantiate the Shwan pertaining to Karka Described in our mission. Lois Agadata says the Gemara. Um, you can't say that according to Ramea, there's a difference. Meaning, we are going to assume according to Ramea, just as you make a shvu on Metatlan, you can make a shvu on Karka as well. Lois Agadata, the Sani, because we have a Bryce, where it mentions Ramea by name. And the Yishvua is applied to Karka as well. Hamach of Parah Bachamar. It's very similar to our Mishnah. So he swapped a Parah for a Chamar Biyoda and he gave birth sometime, somewhere. V'chein HaMercha Shepchas Biyoda. Likewise, he sold his maidservant and same thing happened. Zoyimer B'Shusi V'Zashayisik. So let's say uh, Reuben says it happened my, under my uh, auspices. I, I get the, uh, and the, and the, and the uh, opponent, you know, his opponent just remains silent. Okay. Zohazer. So the one who has the claim wins. Zohar. Zohar, any idea? 
Let's say they're both not sure what happened. Yeah, look at they split up. Let's say they both claim that it happened under their care. And they both have a claim to the item. So now we trigger a shua. So the seller will have to swear that in fact it happened while he was still the owner. Why does he even have to make this shua? Interesting question. Why is he swearing? Why not the buyer? Who says, right? Because typically, anytime we find a shvua in the Torah, who's the one? Who's the party that has to make the shvua? It's meant to absolve you of payment. She says it's based on the Pasuk. So the shvua is meant to absolve you of, uh, of payment. Says Rashi based on Gemara Shvuas. The one who's meant to pay, instead pre- presents a shvua to exempt himself from payment. In this case, it's the seller who's about to lose his item. No, 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 this is what happened, I swear. And he keeps... And he's making a shvua to hold on to his item. And who's speaking? The very Rabbi Meir. The Chacham respond by saying no. No, no, you can't make a shvua because you don't make a shvua in these cases. One of these cases happens to be a disagreement regarding an evad, right? A shifcha. You can't make a shvua on that. Not on the avodim, nor on the karkois. So, the Chacham's response indicates to us that a mayor disagrees on both accounts, right? Because they're responding to him, no, you can't make a shvua on avodim or karkois. Apparently, he disagrees. Lav machal de Rameir Savar, and his boy, you can make a shwan both. So that proves our point. According to Rameir, yes, you can swear regarding a disagreement on Avadim or Kaka. And that fits with our mission. Well, says the Mormon, who says? Who says? Who says? Maybe the Chacham will respond to him like this. Just like, what are you saying? Ki Islam Karkois. We have common ground. We both agree that you don't make a shvur pertaining to a disagreement on real estate, right? Just like you agree with us on that, it's a given. Wouldn't you agree with us regarding slaves as well? Because they're like real estate, halachli, they're connected to real estate, the similarity, there's a lot of similarity, that, right? So the avadim cannot trigger a shvur either. But... Basically, we have no, no longer have a right that a mayor would hold that you make a shvu on karka, maybe only by avodim. And the Chacham was sought to, disp- to sort of disprove a mayor on that as well. Just like you agreed that karka can't trigger shvu on avodim as well. But bottom line, we don't find that a mayor himself would hold he can make a shvu on karka. On ever, yeah, but not on karka. Tate, I'll even prove this point. What am I proving again? That according to a mayor, you don't make a shvu pertaining to a claim on karka. That's not. We have a mission. Mayor, Imer, yeh dvarim ka karka. You know, interesting phenomenon. Sometimes you find. Things which appear, they're connected to the ground, but halachically not regarded like connected to the ground. And you can make a shvur because halachically they're considered like they're disconnected. We'll see in a minute what this is. Ve'ein chachamim ve'edim chacham disagree. If it's connected, it's part of the ground. Keta, for instance, yud gifanim tu'unois masat lacha. Ruben confronts Shimon, he says, look, remember, I asked you to watch over uh, 10 of my vines and they were laden with grapes. Where are they? Shimon denies. He says, no, it was only five. he take back your five. Remember, says, he has to make a shvua. Because although you don't make a shvua on karka, but the, uh, the grapes... We're about to be harvested. They were fully ripe, about to be harvested. They're not really considered karka anymore. They're a separate entity. So it justifies a shvua. No. Kol If you're connected to the ground, you're part of the ground. Haruka karka. You can make a shvua, even on the great part of the claim. And the Gemara explains, we're speaking about grapes which are fully ripe, about to be harvested. The discussion is not pertaining to, you know, uh, Unripe, unripe grapes that are still developing on the vine. No, they're fully ripe. The Maras of our Rameirot, Kirbet Surah is dominant. We treat them as though they've been harvested. It's like any other item. 
which can trigger a shua. Umar Savar Lav Kibitur is Damian. Chacham disagree. No, it's part of the ground. It's the bottom line. It's pretty clear from this discussion that theoretically, conceptually, Ramir agrees that you don't make a shua on karka. He holds this is not karka. But if it's real karka, for instance, the disagreement described in our Mishnah, where the buyer purported that he bought a large field, the seller was only offering a small one, that's true karka related discussion. You wouldn't make a shvua. So this whole pshat is now a bit difficult to accept. We're sort of attributing the Mishnah to Ramir, which was meant to answer all our kashas. It's not really going to work, because how, how can you have a shvua on karka? Oh, let's go back. Let's backtrack to uh, Rabbi Yeshia. All right, but basically we have three kashas on the mission, right? Why is there a shvua? I mean, he's asking apples. He's responding oranges. Even if he would be responding partially to his claim, it's halach. He's offering it outright. Thirdly, there's uh, avodim. Here is Karka, you don't make a shvua on this thing. So we have Rav's Pshat, we have Shmuel's Pshat, we have Reish's Pshat. Reish said that there was a double claim. He's demanding the large Evid with, its, with his garments. The fellow is uh, agreeable to a smaller Evid with smaller garments. Right? So the, the shvua really was triggered by the partial demission on the ksus, on the garment, which justifies the shvua. It's not Halach, as we explained. Because uh, either he's not really offering it now, or because uh, part of the uh, you know the evidence was injured or whatever. Um, and the third question, the, but the question was, I mean, what's the point of discussing this? This is a uh, standard halacha of zaykikin, right? The fact that the garment triggers forms the basis of the shvua. So once you're swearing, you include other things as well. Is that the point of the mission? To teach us the halacha of zaykikin? It's not Allah, which we all know. The Kashi Allah, Zaykikin. Istrich, no, there's a point in mentioning here as well. There's a chidr. Perhaps I would say. Why are we even swearing? Because there's a maid of a miktas on the garments? There was no separate claim on garments. He asked for an evidence with his garments. Who says we're going to focus on the garments per se? You know, when somebody's wearing clothing, his clothing are bottle. A part and parcel of it. They're subordinate to him. They're, they're, they're bottled him. Sagda Tachmina, perhaps I would think. Ksus Evet, the garment sitting on the Evet, Ke dumb. He's treated like the Evet per se. It's one entity. And since the Evet himself can't trigger a Shvo, his clothing can't either. Or in the case of the bundles on the field, the same thing. Oymri Sada Kesada Dami, the bundle that's sitting on the field, it's part of the field. Kamash well, that's the point of the mission to say no. The fact is, I'm asking for two things, two separate things. And if the garment aspect, or in the case of the field, the bundle aspect of the discussion justifies a shvua, there we go. Mission continues. Let's say they're not sure, both not sure. We split it. How many sumchasi, right? This fits with sumchas, the Amar. We're not sure. We split. Okay, so let's move on to the next uh, part of the mission. Right? They're both uh, they're both confident, right, in their uh, in their positions, right? He says uh, gave birth uh, in my rishus. He says it happened there, right? So actually, Rashi. So Rashi says we're going back on the Bryce. A brisa kamaha, the Rashi says. We're going back on the brisa which we began around halfway down the Amid. Okay? So the brisa there discussed the case where they're not sure, they split it. Fine. But the brisa continues. Zeva Bishusi, Zeva Bishusi, Reuben claims the animal gave birth while he owned it. Shemin says it happened after the sale, he owns it. So the seller has to swear that in fact it happened under his auspices. And the question is. In Omar Sumchas, Avili Bari Bari. Now, according to Rabbi Ruhuna's approach, that according to Sumchas, we split things even when both 
parties are confident in their claims, so why is he making a shvua? Just split it. Why does the seller have to swear? Let's just split it. That's what it should have said. So the same terrorist as we said before regarding our mission, why do some of us, even some of us agree in our case? So when the situation warrants a shvua and a because there's a mixes, why the mixes, or the katal yadak, the rabbi was speaking that he removed his hand, or he damaged the field, that's the other case there. So in any case, he's not really giving him back the part that he's admitting. He's admitting, but he's not really offering it back per se because it's still damaged, and, right? So it justifies a shvua and a Torah, and that explains why he's swearing. Says the Mishnah, Meicher Zesav Le'etzin. Reuben sells Shimon uh, ten olive trees with the intent of chopping them down, using them for their wood value, for firewood or whatever. And Shimon diddle-daddled, and he left the, the trees sitting in Reuben's field for the meanwhile. And the trees produced in the meantime, but also pachos, and they produced very little. Pachos mirviyas l'sa. They produced uh, very inferior uh, gra- quality grapes, uh, olives, which from a from a huge amount, of, uh, a huge amount of, of grapes, you can only squeeze out a, a revius halug, which is a very small amount. Okay, it's a very insignificant amount of profit here. Who does it belong to? The landowner or the uh, tree owner? Hare elu shel belongs to the tree owner. Because it's just a, such an insignificant amount, the landlord certainly doesn't care about it. Also, Revius so, but let's say he produced better olives, which that can actually produce a Revius halog of his saw. So if it's less than Revius, insignificant. But if it's a Revius and up, now we have a discussion. So now we have an argument. This fellow says, look, it's my trees that uh, produce this thing. Revius says, what do I mean? It's my land. Each one has a valid, valid claim. In a similar case, we have Shataf Nor Zesav. A big flood came, uprooted my trees, and transplanted them into your field. Now we have a big discussion, a big argument. I say it's my trees that produce. You say it's your property. We split it. Asks the Gemara, how do we get to this point of Revius? What, uh, what were the terms of this agreement? I mean, the Reuben tells Shimon, buy these, uh, you're buying these trees, chop them off right away. I don't want them sitting in my yard. I feel the pochis mirviyas nami. So even if they produce very little, I mean, less than mirviyas, who cares? The balakarka belongs to me, I'm the landowner. You have no business leaving your trees here. Either armale, on the other end, if I gave you the option of, you know, picking them up down the road, kolemas, the boys, kites, whenever you decide to pick them up, right, gesundheit, so then I'm, Allowing it to uh, remain in my field. I feel the is not making the Even if they produce a large amount, who cares? I authorize their stay, right? Gave you free parking. Belongs to you. So the Tzricha must be speaking like this. That it wasn't clear. Darmalei Stama. He sold them the trees, but they didn't really discuss practical, you know, details in terms of times and dates of picking up these trees. So now we say like this. Depends how much uh, produced. Pachas Mervius. The captain ship. It's just a small amount. People are not really uh, mocked on that. And the uh, the tree owner has a right to keep it. Revi is kept the but if it's more than that, the landowner can say, "Look, it's not what I had in mind. I deserve at least part of it." This uh, Revius threshold that we're speaking of, chutzmanayit. So first, I have to keep in mind you have to deduct the um, production expenses, you know, the pressing and the, all that. So once you're done, if you have uh, the, the, the profit amount equals a revius. So then, you know, then we have a, a problem. Then we have, a, you know, a disagreement. But if it's, uh, if it only produces a revius to begin with, and you have to deduct for the expense and all that, then that's considered like less than a revius, and it goes to the tree owner. Okay, let's recap the uh, sugis here. We had a Mishnah uh, with some sort of uh, uncertainty regarding the uh, animal giving birth, the uh, shifcha giving birth. Or we had a case of uh, a slave that was sold, not sure if it was the big one or the small one, regarding a field, big or small. So we go with Simchas that uh, we say, Yachleiku, there's a shadow whether it's only by Shema Vashema, even by Bari Bari, it's a in the Gemara. And we explain why there's a Shvu at all here. I mean, isn't it Karka, isn't it Ravadim, isn't it Halach, isn't it, right? So we have several ways to explain it. Then we conclude with the Alacha of the, um, the olive trees that. Uh, stuck around and produced some uh, some shaman and the question is who it belongs to. All the best to you, Natsalakharab.